few clarifications. The School of Public Policy is not part of the economics department. They wouldn't have us because we're tainted by political scientists, psychologists, lawyers, and other really fine people that, uh, that are important in the, uh, in the uh, study and analysis of public policy. But thank you very, very much. I, you know, I, one of my friends is a former premier of British Columbia, Mike Harcourt, and his line is, I'm a recovering politician. So I'm, I'm also a recovering economist. But uh, you can see from the title that you can't take the economist out of the topic. So I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth. I kept revising my, my talk today because everything I wanted to say was said yesterday. And then Jim gets up here and says more of what I'm going to say. So, you know, be, be patient. Um, I'm going to start, though, with why are we really all here? And I'll call your attention to this, to this quote. It, it sort of frames it, and, and it brings out some of the themes that I'd like to, to emphasize. And you know, the, the, the basic thing that has made me crazy for the last 35 years is why haven't we gotten farther? Why haven't, I mean, this is, I mean, Jim's comment about the complexity of the science is important, but, you know, you can tell your four-year-old grandchild how important it is to protect nature in about five minutes. You know, why can't we get further in actually in investing in the kind of things that do protect nature? So here's just a comment, a quote about, you know, what we're up against, what are the issues? You know, we do get what we pay for, and we're not paying for protecting the natural attributes of our planet. And as, as Jim said, this is because markets don't work without some form of either cooperation or intervention. So that's what I want to talk about today. Here are the key points in case you didn't get, I know they ran out of coffee. There was just the decaf. So. Um, <laughs> In case that wears off, here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, markets can work. As I said, you can't take the economist out of the girl. Markets are a very important part. It's an institution we've had for centuries. Markets work when we get scarcity. They're not real good when we can't perceive the scarcity, and I'll talk about that. Second thing is I think we've got to do a better job of communicating. Even though I can explain it to my four-year-old grandchild, he can't explain it to his friends very well. Uh, but, you know, we've got to get a better way of sort of visualizing this stuff, I think, and getting, getting the message out, not just to the converted. Um, but it's important that we're honest with people, what works and what doesn't work. A lot of the things we've tried sometimes work well, don't work well. We have to communicate what works and what doesn't work. And we also have to tell you how much it costs to get there. Jim's examples were ones of ones that I would say are very cost effective. If you can save a tenth of the cost to get an outcome that you like, that's a good program. But if it costs you more to get protect a couple of hectares or 100 hectares of, of natural area, uh, the budgets are limited. As many of you in the room who work with budgets know, we don't have an infinite supply of money to pour into this stuff. So what works and what doesn't work is really important. And finally, I'll end with a, my perennial pitch, which is we've got to get more of this stuff. Part of the information communication is collating all the good work that you do. So when I'm talking to people about how important this is, it, and, and this is, again, part of the messaging. Here's, here's the egg for the, for the dairy folks out there. Um, you know, in this country, Jim, th there's, there's this tension between the environment and the economy. And a lot of folks, some of our political leaders, who I won't name, uh, talk about them as trade-offs. It's the economy or the environment. But the economy is the yoke in there. It's not the thing that drives the environment. The environment is the part that, that nurtures the economy. So the sooner we start thinking about it and communicating it as it's the environment and the economy, stupid, uh, you know, it's, it's, we, we've got to get that message out. And I'm a grandmother. I have four grandchildren. I think about them a lot. Actually, it's great to be a grandparent. How many grandparents in the room? Yeah, way better gig than being a parent, right? <laughs> way better gig. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I care about what they're going to inherit, you know, and I, I worry about this, I mean, as, as we all do. So we've got to communicate that stuff. 
we've got to say that this is the thing that binds the well-being of, of our whole planet. So in, ensuring the things that Jim and all the others of you talked about as being sustained is really, really important. Now we have this notion that because it's the environment or the economy, that sometimes we can substitute produce things for the natural environment. Oh, let me go backwards for a second. Well, we'll just leave it there. Uh, we can produce things for the natural environment that are substitutes. So Jim's example of a refrigeration unit, which would substitute for the, the good stuff that the riparian zone is going to do, is an example of how we've treated a lot of part of the natural environment in the past, is that if we can build our way out of, out of the conversion, out of having to destroy part of nature, then, then we'll be okay. But there's a limit to that. And if you think about your savings account, you know, do you save for the future? Well, saving natural capital, saving our natural environment is like a really good savings account because you can't eat money, you can't breathe money, you can't, you know, these physical things will run out. But this slide shows you how important natural capital is. These are numbers from uh, Statistics Canada. They are in, point out a few things. They're in dollar terms, not quantity terms. And they're only measuring the produced form of natural capital. These were the things Jim had in his very complex ecology diagram, which were the, you know, the things that we can measure. So this is, this is rocks, trees, and uh, forests, for example. But the point of this slide is like, this is, natural wealth is not a small part of our economy. So again, it's the environment and the economy. But if you look at what those are, and again, I'll remind you that these are in dollar terms, that the big increment over the period from about 2000 is, of course, something you know very well in this, this province, and we're trying to, trying to keep you from exporting in my province, and that would be, uh, you know, uh, energy. So this is the big price spike, not an, a, as well as the output, and here's a picture that sort of shows what's going on. This is a composite picture. This is worldwide, this is not Canada. It's a composite picture of food, uh, non-food, agriculture, metals, and energy. So you can see the price of these natural resources. These are produced natural resources, not the natural capital embodied in the rivers and streams we're talking about. You know, they followed kind of a downward path until post-2000 where they've skyrocketed. So the question is, is our natural wealth going up because of this, and is it going to be sustained? I don't know. And neither do you, and neither does the oil industry, and neither does the forest. The forest industry knows, because they've been through lots of cycles, those of you in the forest industry. This is a prediction graph. It starts in 2020, so you can, you know, the, this is not hard science, it's forecasting. These are people's forecasts, important international forecasting firms to the price of oil. Not one of them goes up. They may all be wrong. The point is, you can't count on the future in terms of the value of these products. So how are you going to interpret this in terms of protecting your natural wealth? Well, the point is, you don't want to count on these. There's uncertainty in the whole thing. So, what are we trying to do with natural capital? What I think, first of all, we've got to have a set of objectives, public policy. These are the ones I think that are important starting points. We're going to want to integrate our programs. And this was sort of part of what Jim and others have been getting at. And no, we do not do a better job in Canada. And I will talk about that. But you have to look at this as a whole. It's not just, oh, we've got a little wetland policy over here or a little fish protection thing over here. This should be much more central to the organization of government and decision making. And I'm going to be talking about markets, but I want to make it very clear that markets, somebody said yesterday, you know, pricing is only one part of a big picture. Regulation, voluntary actions, all of these are part of it, and you want to have them uh, appropriate for the policy at hand. So, as Jim said, some of this is about paying you and some of this is about you paying for what you're doing, and that is an important distinction. Landscape scales, we've talked about. Jim's example, thanks, Jim. Uh, you know, it's nice to relate to what the guy had nicer slides than you do. Um, had, you know, the story of how important it is to look at it at a watershed. They couldn't have done that Oregon thing if it was just the last five kilometers of the river. And then, as I've said, cost effectiveness. 
So here's just some of the regulatory policies, and these are things people talked about yesterday. I'm not going to be talking about it, but we, we talked about land, you talked about land restriction, the agricultural land reserve in BC being one of those protected areas. Something we haven't talked about and we don't have time to, but it's a whole other subject, is where does environmental impact assessment fit into protecting nature? I'm going to be talking about incentive-based policies, and these are, as, as others have said, we are purchasing the right to use something in a particular way. And I'm not going to go through this list, but here's just a schema of all the different ways that we can talk about it. Important distinction, though, is between voluntary and mandatory. When the regulatory structure is out there, a market ceases to be voluntary and becomes mandatory. So, we're focusing on markets. Why is it so tough? I want to add some more reasons than what, what Jim talked about. And I'm going to talk more about the sort of social psychological stuff. I've emphasized the words here are recognized, because I think part of this is a knowledge-based thing. But why haven't, why haven't we gotten further? Scarcity. I think we think, and not, not you, you're, you don't think this. But others say, you know, we're just, there's just so much of it. Canada is one of the most endowed countries in the world for natural capital, natural resources. There's so much of it, we can't possibly look at it as a scarce resource. The dominance of the status quo, you know, I'm okay, don't mess with me. Don't, don't, you know, don't tell me I'm, first of all, don't tell me I'm doing something bad. We don't know. I mean, not only is some of the ecology complex, we simply don't even understand pathways. We in British Columbia are about to embark on a very large experiment called extraction of natural gas through hydraulic fracturing. We do not know what that impact is going to be on the aquifers and the surface waters. We're beginning to know. We're beginning to look at that complex interaction. Uh, you know, we do not have aquifer groundwater mapping because it's, it's hard. It's, you know, geologists are working on it, hydrologists are working on it. So part of this is genuine lack of understanding or lack of knowledge of the complexity of our natural environment. Free riders, as Jim has talked about, and property rights. Sometimes they're not well defined, but also there's historical precedents to property rights which make it challenging to come in and say, no, you have to do something differently. And then there's this problem about planning for the future. I am going to save more tomorrow because I, I really need this stuff today. You know, I got I to gotta do something today. Tomorrow comes and I go, I'm going to save more tomorrow. And then the next day comes and I'm still going to save more or I'm going to wash my toilets tomorrow. But, you know, no, that goes on another week. Don't come to my house. Um, you know, they're still, uh, they're, they're clean, but uh, don't, don't eat off the floor. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of that, we call it hyperbolic discounting. It's a fancy term for people. People don't think about the future, or they really do think about the future, but when the future comes, they're still thinking about the future. So, what are the principles? Well, we want to understand the linkages, as Jim said. We want to align them. There's a whole bunch of stuff we have to align. Spatial characteristics, scale, time scale, uh, single dimensional ecosystem services, as he mentioned, versus, versus bundling them. Do we look at them one off? Do we look at them as a composite? And the big problem that people have alluded to yesterday was this problem of additionality. How do you know that the thing that you're buying or the thing that you're selling is something that is different than what you would have done had we not come in and offered you money for it. And this is a significant problem that has, 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 has caused trouble for a number of, of programs. And then there are these people that think they can get away with stuff. I'm going to build a polluting factory so that you can pay me to shut it down. OK, markets. Here's a little scheme. There are lots of kinds of markets, as, you've, as we've talked about over the last day. The, the arrow going down is sort of like it's more a pure market at the top, and then it's a market-like thing in the sense that it generates prices at the bottom. So here's, here's just a little taxonomy of it. And I'm not going to go through all the examples, but just to point out sort of one of the things I think is really important is getting a mapping of your problem with the type of market or the type of pricing system that goes best with it. So a pure exchange is something where we have a, a type of thing, product that we're selling, that's fairly homogeneous. 
It's, it's identical. We're selling apples. We're selling water quality. Uh, that's not very homogeneous. We're selling some component part, and there are lots of buyers and sellers. Examples where this works is more on the, on the regulatory side, the pollution side, where we're selling uh, you know, and buying uh, uh, sulfur dioxide credits or in the European trading system, greenhouse gases, the Northeast uh, US trading system for greenhouse gases, and now the Western Climate Initiative, which is getting rolling in California and Quebec. Clearing houses are agents that act to do that exchange. Again, you have a large number of buyers and sellers, but the complexity of the ecosystem goes up. So it's not like a one price clears the market. It will be multiple prices. You're going to be more tailoring the situation. And that would be more applicable to things like wetlands, where geography and, and the complexity of the system is increasing, uh, carbon offsets, and uh, clean development mechanism, which is a carbon offset internationally and some of these transferable uh, development permits, which where, you're, where you really have to look at the attributes. Mitigation, conservation, banking, you now are experts in. I don't need to talk about it. And a lot of the stuff we do is bilateral, one-off. And that's where prices are not uniform. They're going to be highly variable. So this is where you've got smaller numbers, a lot of diversity. So it just gives you a range of the types of, of markets that you can use. Actually, we do have some of these in Canada, surprisingly. Uh, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Um, there, there are examples of it, but way more on the voluntary side. And I can't, you've had many of the examples over the last day. Um, some of them are pilots, some of them are ongoing, but we do have examples of these things, mostly voluntary because we have very few regulations, Jim, that make people do things in this country. Where we do have legislated stuff, it's more on the polluter pay side. So it's uh, greenhouse gases, and uh, in some cases, I think there's going to be more uh, regulatory oomph in your wetlands protection and also water use. And then we have a number of fixed price things called, I know I'm not allowed to say this word in Alberta, taxes. Um, so I'll move on quickly. Um, as I said, why not more, though? Voluntary, not regulatory. We do not have a Clean Air Act. We do not have a Clean Water Act. We have guidelines. We have things. Canada is a very nice country. Um, do things because you want to do it, because you're a good citizen. Um, we, we don't have that regulatory thing. I'm not suggesting we go down a very rigid, regulatory, legalistic path. But having the oomph behind uh, the, the willingness to do good in a regulatory format does make things move a little more quickly. Uh, we do have multiple, as we all know, levels of government. The authority for which it is so clearly spelled out in the Constitution that we've never had a legal case deciding who gets the right to, uh, I'm being very facetious, who gets the right to decide what level of government is doing it. We have concurrent responsibilities. We also have ones where the level of government may cede it. I think a really important issue, and I know a number of you in the room are dealing with this, is the municipal level. I deal with the municipal level a lot. I think the grassroots ground level is where a lot of the initiatives are coming from. And the big problem is not only is there no or less legal authority to do the sorts of things that we might want to do in setting up markets or pricing or other regulatory thing, the funding levers aren't there. So municipalities are creatures of the province. They do not have independent standing, as we know well. And that is, I think, a huge barrier to moving. And addition to that is the, the, the lack in many provinces of, of regional authorities. So, but we got to convince voters. Because voters elect our decision makers. And our decision makers are the ones that have got to say, it is the environment and the economy, and I'm going to stand up and do something about it and not try to pit it, as we've had in this country, the political rhetoric that says that you can't have both. You must make a choice. But it's up to us to elect the people that will see it the way I think we should see it. So the other thing we've got to recognize, though, is not all programs work. And we've got to be honest about this and share both the successes and the failures. I mean, we've had pilots where it doesn't work. And if you look at the conditions under which markets work, you can see why. Some of them fail because there are not enough buyers and sellers. You can't run an exchange with too few people. You just aren't going to get the trading and the price determination. Complexity. 
leads to high transaction costs, which then says, I mean, I'm trying to do an auction and I've got a 50-page booklet that I'm handing to you to figure out how you're going to bid for the types of ecosystem services on your land. That's not going to work either. So complexity, and, and you know, the ecology can be complex, but figuring out a way to do it that is not so complex and convoluted that people have a hard time. I think sometimes we haven't let things go long enough. We've got funding for two, three years. We don't get to demonstrate the value of these kind of pilot programs. Sometimes we're using the wrong policy. We're using a, a, a unidimensional sort of treatment of ecosystem services, and it should be multiplicity. So those are some of the other issues. Can't prove additionality, short story. We have carbon offsets in our province. Uh, we have the carbon neutral government policy, regulatory policy, all public sector entities with some exclusions have to be carbon neutral. We set up a thing, the government set up a thing called the Pacific Carbon Trust. It sold offsets so that I as a, uni I, as a university, my university can be carbon neutral by buying an offset, which is some additional, in theory, additional way to sequester carbon. Uh, the Pacific Carbon Trust no longer exists as an entity. It, uh, it is, 150 people work there, well-meaning, good people. Some of their contracts could not show additionality. There are now four or five people working. They've been absorbed into the Ministry of the Environment. Pacific Carbon Trust doesn't exist. The offset program does. So additionality is a really thorny thing. You do need baselines. You do need monitoring. And sometimes we just don't know. We have incomplete information. So what works? Specific targets, monitoring enforcement, producing those outcomes, sustaining it over time, adapting to conditions, and making sure you're doing things as efficiently as possible. What do we need to move forward? Get the design right. Start with those pilots you're doing. Experiments are cheap, too. In, uh, Vic and I go over to other parts of the world where people can do more experiments. And uh, sometimes you can do this in an experimental system. You can find out the flaws. You can test a program experimentally with cheap things like university students. And um, <laughs> they'll work for a lot less than real people. Um, and <laughs> no, we have very good students out there. I do want to commend them. They are superb. And we'll talk about them later. Um, getting buy-in, uh, Jim and everybody's talked about this. This has to come from the ground up. Money, and I'm going to talk about money in conclusion, and government support. So how do we pay for this stuff? I did want to give you some, some uplifting comments. Well, one of the things we could have done, note the past tense, is use the money we are taking from the rents and royalties from our re non-renewable resources, put them into a fund, to invest in protecting ecosystem services. That would have been kind of a way to transition from those non-renewable resources to the renewable ones, to sustainability, et cetera. But the funds don't tend to get, tend to get used for other things, who governs the use of the funds, and they're always trade-offs. The more I protect nature, the less I'm going to spend on education. And in my, in my province, there's a clear mandate. The government does not want to pay for ecosystem services. You've got to find another way to do it. Well, here's some new and some recycled ideas. How about a Canada pension plan for, the, for nature? How about making it a plan, doesn't have to be a lot, that you start paying into? Now, it doesn't come back to you. It becomes a public good, but as part of your you know, how, it's part of your, it's tax time. I just did my taxes. I'm, I'm one of those people that likes to do their taxes. You know, it's always a surprise. Do I owe them or do they owe me? Um, and, you know, it's kind of a fun thing. Um, <laughs> told you you can't take the economist out of the girl. But, you know, how about just a, you know, I don't care what the amount is. $5 per taxpayer per year goes into an NPP, the Nature Pension Plan. Now, I'm not sure I want to trust the federal government. I'm sure you don't want to trust the federal government. So we could allocate this based on the taxpayers of each province. It would go back to the province, and it's a dedicated earmarked fund. So it's paying for those ecosystem services on the land. So we don't have to raise all the money locally. Nature is a public good. There are benefits to all this stuff, whether they're local or regional. How about an NPP? Green bonds. 
this is something I'm not real sure about. We don't have time to talk about it, but I'm not real sure that it's something you and unique. But there are big investment, you know, banks, big financial entities now marketing green bonds for green infrastructure. This is not a payment for ecosystem services, but it's investing in natural attributes, whether they're whether there's you know better sewage treatment plants or whatever. Securitization, making those folks that are looking at disrupting the natural environment, whether it's aggregate stripping as one of those posters out there, or whether it's uh, uh, bitumen or fracking or forestry, putting the money up front to ensure that we are you know, there to, to recover the natural environment should we can. Uh, we're gonna have a whole talk on crowdsourcing, so I'm not gonna say any more, but I'm gonna put in the pitch. Local referenda, there's also a, another advertisement for that, for the Kootenays. And tax recycling, again, mm -hmm. this is sort of like instead of the pension plan, it's like, well, we're gonna tax you for the bad things, but we're gonna put it into the good things. And then, as some folks talked about yesterday, the sort of development, uh, the development permit types. What I wanna end with, though, is back to communication. I don't think we're doing ourselves, and there is so much going on in this country. I was gonna summarize a bunch of different programs, but the, I'd, I'd be here for three hours. There are so many things going on at the grassroots level, at some at the provincial level, very little at the federal level, uh, but you know, we don't know. I don't know what's going on. It would take me a long time. So I think the Land Institute should clone itself. And there should be a provincial one in every province. So all you need to do is find another, you know, wealthy, well, maybe industry would like to pay for this. And we would have a land institute in every province. We used to have, we, we do have a thing called the uh, Council of the Canadian Ministers of Environment. They don't meet anymore. So we don't have a mechanism by which we can share this data, this information, what are you doing across the country. So I think it's gonna be up to us in civil society and the private sector to do this sort of thing. Come together, have a staff, pool this information, put it out on a web page. My, my argument is the more we know about what is going on, what the trade-offs are, what the successes are, what works and what doesn't work, we can save ourselves a lot of time and get a lot more mileage out of it. So we need something that's pan-Canadian. We need something that pulls together the work, the good work that all of you and many of you are doing in this room. We also need to communicate better I, in, in terms of using modern technology. Google the thing I've got up there, uh, four, four ways to slice Obama's 2013 budgets in the New York Times. It's one of the budgets, again, you know, not a topic that a lot of people find cool. If you look at that, you will love it. It has every budget item, whether it's growing, whether it's shrinking, you can tell what goes where. We could do the same sort of thing to talk about ecosystem services programs, what they're saving, you know. It's just a way to show people how important this is, you know, where things are shrinking, where things are growing. You know, use the data we've got. We've got to collect more, but use the data we've got. And finally, this is not a unidimensional thing. Protecting ecosystem services, it's about the environment and our well-being. Link it to health. Link it to all the sorts of things. Wellness. You know, you've got to show this stuff. I think we have to show this stuff more vividly. I want to end optimistically. I think we're, we're, we're at the point where there's a lot of policy windows opening. Climate change has a huge role for ecosystem services. You know, carbon offsets, the markets that are working are in carbon. So this is a way to, you know, nature to, to be a big part of that. Ag lands, forest lands, et cetera, even in urban areas. Water pricing, as you know, in the southern part of your province, water is a very scarce, very scarce good. And that's another area where we're gonna see things opening up. Food safety and security. Don't want another XL plant. Don't wanna to have to destroy the industry for things that ecosystem services could help protect. As I've said, health and sustainable lifestyles, congestion and air quality, all important things. So I'm gonna leave you with one thought. It's off a blog, and basically the message is, the longer we wait, the more it's gonna cost us. Thanks very much.